A cappella. Can you hear me? Please stand up. Everybody, uh, if you're up there, uh, down here, please stand up. We're just going to do a quick little exercise. I'll bring this down. A lovely way to start an interaction with any kind of people is to do laughing yoga. There are four segments in laughing yoga. We will do the first two segments. Put your hands below your rib cage. It's called a diaphragm, I think. English is my second language, bear in mind. And then you just, huh. You should feel something happening. Huh. Fantastic, okay. Just watch me now. This is what we're going to do together in about 20 seconds. You stand on your toes and you raise up your hands and you breathe in. Don't do it. Wait, wait for me to do it one time before we do it together, okay? <sighs> okay, you get it? You breathe in and then you laugh it out because you release the endorphins and that will set you free. Okay, one, two, three. <gasps> Fantastic, please sit down. The clicker works. It's always nice when you're on stage and the clicker works. The guy in the middle is, was a famous Russian director. His name is Andrei Tarkovsky. The only reason why I know about him is because I went to Google Images a few days ago and I searched for big camera in the desert. <laughs> this is the photo that came up and I think it kind of shows you visually the complexity and the need for coordination when you were filming things in the past. Here you see they had, they had the camera on a track and I thought I could show you visually how it's being done now for some people. Can you see it? You cannot. Okay, you see the track thing? So basically you can move it like this. And you have the same kind of thing. And you, maybe you can see it, the people in the back can see it. It's, it's quite, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So back in the days, you had to kind of break through a lot of barriers to enter the world of filmmaking. And even today, if you want to do broadcast stuff or make feature movies, there's a lot of rules and structures that you have to follow. And uh, just to, um, to give you an explanation why I'm doing a lot of filmmaking and a lot of people in the world are uh, interested in the world of film, because I think you enter a different world and you have the ability to take the story wherever you want to go. This quote by my fellow countryman, Ingmar Bergman, kind of explains that. Tarkovsky, for me, is the greatest director, the one who invented a new language, true to the nature of film, as it captures life as a reflection, life as a dream. This guy in the middle, I don't want to be in the way. This guy in the middle, he's a Swedish guy too, Sven Nyqvist, a cinematographer. I never heard about him, but he likes to work with Andre, the Russian director. So he came up on Wikipedia, and back in the days, you know, everybody had all these different roles, you know. But now, the cinematographer can be the filmmaker, the filmmaker can be the director, the director can be the editor. It's all getting very blurry. So today, because of the web, because of cheaper technology, this hierarchy of filmmaking is becoming very flat. And small DSLR cameras are democratizing filmmaking. Many, many years ago, only a few people had the ability to read and write. Now, all of us here in this room, the people in the global north, western hemisphere, all can read and write. We take it for granted. But what we're seeing now is that because of guerrilla filmmaking, Video literacy is on the rise, where everybody has the ability soon to tell stories through video. I want to take you on a little journey. We are on a boat last year in southern Turkey, in the Turkish Ocean. And there's this funny, crazy chef guy called Jose Andres. He's from Spain. He lives in D.C. And we've been hanging out with him at different events. We were not really friends yet, but we knew that he had a birthday. 
So we tried to call him from the boat, and he didn't answer, so we sent him an email and put his secretary, Russell, in the CC. A few minutes later, Russell emails back and says, Jose is on his way to Haiti. So we jump on a bus, go up to Istanbul, buy our flight, and then the day after, we fly to Haiti. And we arrive to Jose, and we ask him, what is the story you want to tell? There are millions of stories that you can tell, but what is the story you want to talk about? We are here now. We haven't prepared anything, but we have a lot of different networks and organizations that we are connected to. And through those connections, we can very quickly mobilize and figure out how to best tell that story. So what happened in the next seven days, we walk around, and through connections, we get access to different places where we're filming. And I want to visually show you how I see the world. So your eyes is like a 35 millimeter lens. If you are a fish, you're like an 18 millimeter lens. It's very wide. And then you have the 24, and then you have the 35 and the 50, and if it's very far away, you use the 85. So wherever you walk around on the streets when you're telling a story, you see the world through different lenses. And you walk around and you see a balcony, you see a rooftop, and as a guerrilla filmmaker, you try to figure out how can you get up there so you can film the world from that angle. It's all about being very flexible and working with limitations. This is a photo from Cité Soleil in Port-au-Prince. The UN considered it to be the most dangerous place on Earth a few years ago. We got connected through a fixer there, through an organization. He became our friend. He took us there and walked with us through the community. And because we were attached to him, he added credibility to us so that we could tell the story of those communities. If we would have tried to enter City Soleil without him, we would not be able to film for more than five minutes. It's here at the waterfront of City Soleil that we take one of our more controversial photos. There's a very thin line between overstepping someone's privacy and capturing genuine video content. It took us a long time to fly from Turkey to Haiti, but it was even a longer journey that we've been on for the last five years to get to this position. For the last five years, we've been over 60 countries filming for different nonprofits and social businesses. And the first thing that I learned in Haiti was that it's very hard to do solar cooking when there's no sun out. I also realized that there's no reason for me to try to separate work and life as a guerrilla filmmaker because every day is a Saturday and you work on every Saturday. Guerrilla filmmaking is about going out to remote parts of the world with less equipment because you have less equipment you get that access and you can also do it by feet because feet are some amazing two things that will take you places that you could not think about going. This place is Lido Beach, Mogadishu, Somalia. Guerrilla filmmaking is about going to Lido Beach on Friday morning, play some soccer, football with the people before you start filming to build that repertoire, to build that relationship, and to be able to tell that story about people coming back to the beach, they need to be comfortable with your presence. Guerrilla filmmaking is about staying positive when life is tough. It's about eating bananas when you've been to the toilet more than four times in a day. <laughs> it's about eating anything that is coming your way. And it's about buying a local SIM card with a data plan when you enter a new country. Not only because you have the ability to communicate with the world and the community that you work in, but the people in that community that you're in, they will be very comfortable to call you and communicate with you because if you had a foreign number, they would lose all, all their airtime and all their minutes if they try to call you. Guerrilla filmmaking is about becoming one with your surroundings. It's about figuring out innovative ways of charging your phone and your camera batteries when there is no electricity. It's about calculated risk. It's about making people extremely comfortable with your presence. And it's about realizing that Good quality audio is usually more important than good quality video. In conclusion, it's about learning by doing. 
And our switch point came after we've been on the road filming for a few years. We realized that the most powerful platform for us to connect with people was through the camel. There are camels in over 100 different countries. The country with the most camels, Somalia. So we dedicated one year to travel around the world. We went to 20 different countries filming camels, camel people, and the white gold of the desert. What is the white gold of the desert? Camel milk. Thank you. Because we fell in love with the camel people, the camel people fell in love with us, and they enabled us to tell their stories. So now the first thing we do when we come to a camel-centric location, we go to the market, we buy heaps of camel milk, and then we drink it together with the people we're working with. And I brought some camel milk. This is from uh, Kilmayoro. I was there a month ago. And I milked these camels myself, uh, and I would like to drink it uh, quickly to test it with you because I put it in the freezer. It can be up in the freezer for six months. I put it in the freezer in New York when I got back, and uh, I haven't opened the lid. And I can just imagine that it's going to be fermented and sour, but with camel milk, the more sour, the better, uh, some people say, because there's so much good bacteria in it. Uh-huh, you could, I heard a little pshh. Okay, so I didn't really shake it enough maybe, but mm, it smells smoky because the way you store camel milk in most parts of the world, you store it in uh, kind of wooden containers that you smoke out to kill all the bad stuff in between uh, day one and day two. <sighs> we can drink more together on this, but it's such a bonding experience to drink camel milk together with other people. And the camels have been very important for us in our life. And another switch point for us was the TEDx community. In the last four years, there have been 4,600 TEDx events in over 149 countries. Right now, online, over 25,000 TEDx talks. It's a very interesting movement. And because it's so organic, we don't really know what kind of impact it will have but it has the potential to really do some positive damage to this world. So once again, we used the camels as a platform, and we got invited to go to the TEDx Summit in Doha, Qatar. Qatar is located at the tip, at the little thing sticking out from Saudi Arabia. And 700 TEDx organizers had flown in from 110 different countries to come together for one week, to figure out the future of the movement and how can you share resources as a community. And we were there to film their stories. And when you are in these disruptive environments where you have people from all walks of life coming together, you bump into people like Hans Rosling, Swedish guy, really inspiring, and his ability to kind of tell stories through time and data. I mean, talking about big data, this is the big data guy, you know? And one of the coolest stories that he likes to tell over and over again is, that people have the strive for getting a washing machine more than the strive for democracy. That's his conclusion from putting big data together. And when you are a guerrilla filmmaker, you're out with all these energies colliding, you have the ability to capture new ideas before they become mainstream. And you get inspired to do more. So we went to Somalia, and we put together the first ever TEDx event in Somalia, TEDx Mogadishu, and we used guerrilla filmmaking tactics we used the DSLR camera and we live streamed that event throughout the entire world. And we had the opportunity to connect with Hassan Mohammed. And his story is that back in 2005, there was no uh, proper universities to really uh, work through. So he set up his own university. He hacked, in, uh, he hacked education and, you know, working with limitations. You might think that they don't have internet, but they get internet from a satellite at the company a few miles away. And you walk into a new room, and you guys get more and more inspired at each place. One room that I walked into, 10 guys were sitting down drinking tea. Somali tea is basically tea with 10 spoons of sugar. And then I asked, can I have some tea too? And I, they served me tea, and I said, this is the most amazing student tea room that I've ever seen. I wish I had one of these in my universities. 
And then they all laugh and tell me that this was actually not a student tea room. This is where all the lecturers hang out between classes. And I felt a little bit stupid. <laughs> this is the most inspiring program that I believe that they had at that university. It's the nursing program. They had all this really cool medical training equipment. And it was probably a few generations uh, outdated from what is used in the Western world. But yes, the whole idea that this university, without any foreign intervention, no development organizations have been given them money. There, are, there were no government departments uh, that could support this initiative. But very resilient, homegrown, and yes, without, with limitations, building this. It's such a cool, cool project. And you, when you're out filming, you bump into these people all the time. And it's, that's, I think, is what keeps me going, you know? And TEDx Mogadishu inspired the, the head of communications for United Nations Development Program, Somalia, to reach out to us and to say, hey, we're doing this thing with the UN Foundation, Social Good Summit. Do you guys want to work with us to put together the Mogadishu event? So we did doing that, and that led to more work with UNDP. So we started doing visual capacity training around Somalia, where we work with local staff to figure out how they can tell their stories through photography and film. So why is it important to mobilize people so that they can tell their own stories? We believe that real change is not the media pushing the big stories, but the actions of millions of people doing small things and accumulatively, accumulatively, when you bring things together, English is my second language, I'm sorry. When you bring things together, you know, and we can enable this kind of to show this through video and people showing their own videos, that's when you have real change and that's when you can fast forward progress. So, guerrilla filmmaking is about building partnerships and we could push out our videos, our photos through our own channels, but real change comes when you work together with different platforms, different partners, and that's how you create a conversation between different groups of people and get real impact. It's all about coming together and figuring out how we can collaborate. Collaboration is really everything. And participatory filmmaking is a part of this, where everybody who's a part of the dialogue and a part of the film needs to feel that ownership. There's this company that I bumped into a few, a few days ago. They're called C3. They're based in Chicago. And a few years ago, when they were founded, they had this idea that if nonprofits and causes can better communicate through sight, sound, and motion, they will become more successful. So what we're seeing now is that nonprofits are using video to show their most vital work and tell compelling stories. Their, their idea a few years ago is becoming the reality. And it's, it's really interesting with guerrilla filmmaking because you are only as good as your last movie. And that goes for everything. You're only as good as your last startup, your last health intervention. The field of filmmaking is open. Anyone can borrow, rent, or learn filmmaking right now and go out there and create. It's pretty cool. Never stop moving. Thank you very much. <laughs>